Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our final reading in the Holloway Poetry Series here at UC Berkeley. Uh, I'm John Shoptaw, the, uh, the spring curator. Uh, and uh, please uh, help me welcome uh, this evening's Holloway poet, Ann Carson. I want to also uh, welcome Pegasus Books. You see the books here, and Pegasus is standing behind them, uh, figuratively. Um, feel free after the reading to browse and freer to buy Ann Carson's book. She'll be happy to sign copies after her reading. Um, and special uh, thanks to my cohort, uh, Christopher Miller, uh, who has made these hallway readings just a pleasure. And uh, that's what they should be. Thanks so much. Thank you. We'll begin uh, tonight's reading uh, uh, with uh, an exciting poet and grad student in English, Jillian Osborne. Then uh, Michelle T., uh, a grad student in English, will introduce Ann Carson, uh, who will then uh, take the stage, being Ann Carson, and read to us. Uh, <laughs> Please, uh, at this time, if you haven't already, turn off those uh, phones and any other electronic noisemakers. Um, and uh, now, if you will, uh, please welcome uh, Jillian Osborne. Um, I'm very excited to hear Anne Carson read, and I'm very excited to be her opening act, and also terrified. Um, but I'm going to read um, some new things um, that are all pretty kind of different from each other. The first is called Occasions, and it sort of sets off from Dunn's um, Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions, which is a chronicle of an illness. Um, where he sort of says each stage of the illness and then writes from there. So it's called Occasions. One, what does the water laving the shores of Iceland say? What are those days when I was well? A well, a continent, a cliff, a curtain, or a face? Moss goes dark under moonlight. Moss subtracts from the rock. You know the language of plants is that rejected green our eyes absorb, an island or a bell. Bees discover a blue belonging to Cianthus, a blue lure, a blue hinge. Other blossoms swallowed it. Wind sounds scale the smallest rungs, fragrance or sound. Where does the body end? A shrub along a cliff or a hive. We cannot enjoy death. The bees fill their legs with yellow, careening upon return. A week ago, they cared for young, sterilized their geometry, conducted honey, a scavenger or a scout. The others evict brittle bodies. I observe them scattered on the ground. Two. <clears throat> In Iceland, I observe the leaves, repositories of everything else that drops inside of eyes and disappears. The leaves are elevators, intermediaries, winged androgens painted on the ceilings of museums. They are not syllables, not lilies, not doves on fire that dissolve the window pane. The pale gray air enters them, and they expel it. I take their rejections into cilia thickening lungs. Three, on the nth day of my sickness, I take to my bed a book, an underwater sound, whose ice is the color of color unresolved, their bodies in daily ringing remembered. Whales shoot gutturals, ice buoys and shouts of others in inverse emptiness, the water a way off and molecules partitioned apart. 
When lungs break, languages scatter out. Volcano, a battery, and a batterer. And then these next two poems are from some things I've been writing about the French Revolutionary Calendar, which, um, if you know it, um, is a calendar in which the months are named after seasonal conditions. So um, the two I'm going to read are based on Frimer and Pluvios, which is the month of frost and the month of rain. So the frost one. Cold traces skeletal leaves along window shields. Imagine the season destroys patterns is no longer an invisible witch carving lace to the tune of ventricles and stoma. Glass isn't the sort of substance that can see through these days, transparent as chilly silk. Intricate obstruction where once breath effaced brittleness's face. Where is frost after all now that we've forgotten? Time taken back the paintbrush, the tiniest hands, the pickaxe, and left legendary panes that are blank, no drop of temperature will scrawl on. We invited glaciers in and salt. Dampness is the saddest season not only because it resembles your face or your face in the window, in the train window that has been enhanced by more purposiveness without purpose, which is to say an outmoded mode of transportation by beauty, a technology like nostalgia that sings obsolescence. The smell of the wet earth and the sky is money laundering, and after these surfaces spanking new, fangled and distracted, dewy, sparkling, still crimped in their plastic dresses for purchasing as bulbs grow feverish, coughing up hyacinth, crocus, narcissus. And then the last thing I'm going to read is um, related... It's, an, it's part of an elegiac thing. And um, so it's sort of, the thing I'm going to read surrounds a bunch of poems that I wrote in this kind of the months immediately following a death. And recently I've gone back and extracted those from something else and built this other structure around them. Um, and it's just called garlands, the whole thing. But I'm only reading the, the structure, knitting these other earlier poems together. Before this moment, stranger, I failed to believe that you exist, summon you to surrender you in some dim space, a subway network, a shaded alley, abandoned pleasure grounds. Is this the lost circuit where you look through books? But those are places where I walked. If you return to life, it is a sign your imagination is deficient. Imagination punctured and incomplete, the bruised mountains and palm trees like scarcely moving pictures from the table, the animal or the child throwing its voice across the alley. Garland was a person, Shelley's flaming heart along a beach. Now I am older, now I begin, against this coarse cotton, fluttering my hands like cages but it is always sharp. Love then, love that is the greatest nothing, asleep in a pile of blankets on a floor during a typhoon breath filling and retreating in our mouth. He took the rocks from the bottoms of streams and removed them. The last time he threw himself naked into an ocean where only wetsuits mistaken for seals regularly swim. When I tell you these things, they are fiery eyes and liquid skin. Telling turns a corner beyond which you are reading. Are you reading? Carving in black strokes on corrosive expanses of light, almost negligible whirring, beyond which a man recedes into horror, even tears, even things you cannot touch. Before Garland died, we said goodbye for years. We walked through garbage in the rain. All my bracelets fell open at the clasp. We are both better, he wrote days earlier, in the early light on the porch of the temple from which it is an expression reckless lives are flung. 
These days happened. At night, we lay on the table by the man-made lake and watched electricity corrode the sky. His name. Taken from him, it seems to rise above him like a flag. Garland, I thought the hawks above the hill had something of you left in them. On the, boss, on the bus to the lake, we argued, Odyssey or Iliad. The cakes after the mountains were eggshell blue and fairy tale pink and white. He spent the last year building structures he wasn't allowed to speak of. We didn't speak of the structures or of almost anything that was real. Arguments like these were hills we lived inside. What can your hands do? Do they fall through windows as a child? I bury myself in the landscape painting where you were. Now that uneven season begins again, winter when we open our eyes in summer threatening night, benevolent month, a month of thrusting. I run down the hill along the park in a sleeveless pink dress to that room where you were reading and drinking but never drunk. You were reading, men lavishly fucking their way through words. I gave you the book or the idea for reading it. You threw yourself backward onto your hands on the pavement, forward into the hail. The blood stood out like holes in your white shirt or the ice tore through and buried itself in your skin. How long did this last? We broke into the old room when it was summer and came together on the narrow bed, lived on in other places along the scaffolding, the roof that was restricted from which the Hudson that is brackish northward all the way to Albany passively evolved its harbor course. The nine-story window, the mossy ledge over breakers in Ireland, the island chopping off into wreckage, it was a choice, a frequent choosing, like raising a voice. I don't regret it, the jungle of Hawaii invaded by species, lava broiling into the sea, your voice. You watched the tide coming in over the causeway. I watched you watch it. You put your face in the orb of seed. You rubbed your genitals against the surface. The water forced itself between the stones and the light was inhuman and strong. On a train in an alleyway in the dirt, I followed through the unfamiliar city. Pricking of blood and limbs gone absent, contiguous with thermals. From the window, you introduced yourself in three languages, then landed on the floor. Now I see you, your pink shoulders raw from walking through daylight, storming the wharf at dawn, tossing your body from pole to plank, raging and rattling your mane. Your ears, my eyes, in the emptiness of the room where we escaped, misreading the misdeeds, a woman for a cat, locusts or sycamores submerged in opacity, wheels skipping over the segments between bricks. Reader, why do we argue? We have taken the train into the city. We have kept the whole day to ourselves, but we have embarrassed them. They give our love a wide berth. The parks are structured. The tulips are generic and stupid, red with spidery splat shedding themselves. I am weeping in public. You run down the alleyway with the keys to the apartment. I am shouting your name in the main square, but you have ascended the walls. The walls made of stones from several centuries. My throat glints off their sides. Garland's last name was English. You don't need me to tell you that names have other names. Time passes, I am afraid. I bike by the corners, the patches of grass, the places we defiled with our affection and made more beautiful because of those defamations. Limestone and shale. The rain, the rain like an empty aurora borealis along the hill. He was a person I knew. I welcomed. He pulled me up beside him in the tree. Thank you. I'm not sure if you can even see me, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> 
I did not know how to make good on one chance to introduce an artist like Ann Carson. So rather than trying to fit her into a single thing, which surely cannot be done, I decided instead to offer 14 different ways of acquainting you with her, in the hope that at least one of them might not misfire. <laughs> Ann Carson, number one, what her books tell you. Ann Carson was born in Canada and teaches ancient Greek for a living. Ann Carson, number two. I read somewhere on the internet that when Ann Carson was five years old, she was so thoroughly captivated by an illustrated book that she started to eat it. <laughs> the volume in question was called The Lives of Saints. Ann Carson, number three. There are some who conceive of the translator's task as being akin to the tricky business of transferring the contents of one vessel into another vessel, all while trying to ensure that as little as possible is spilled in the process. Success, in this view, goes to the one who manages to minimize loss during the difficult labor of exchange. As a translator, Ann Carson takes up the original vessel and runs with it toward a volcano, <laughs> watching how all that brims over forms strange patterns on the ground below. I have heard some say that translations like hers are not faithful, speaking about ancient texts as if they were some old husband worried about the prospect of infidelity. <laughs> Often, Carson intensifies the delight of anachronism until it becomes something else altogether. Of course, Antigone can't stop quoting Hegel, and naturally, Helen of Troy, that beautiful thing, is casually referred to as a weapon of mass destruction. <laughs> Such translations seem quite faithful, not in the sense that they steadfastly reproduce the original, but in the sense that they are made possible by a surfeit of belief. Ann Carson, number four. Ann Carson is a poet who writes things like this. Town and farewell to you. Look at a thousand blue, thousand white. Thousand blue, thousand white, thousand. Blue thousand, white thousand, blue thousand, white thousand, blue wind today and two arms blowing down the road. I can't believe that worked. <laughs> And Carson number five. <laughs> Carson's translation of Sappho's fragments is stunning, both for the words it speaks and for the carefully laid silences that seem to demure from the act of full textual reconstruction. Throughout her work, the white sustenance of the blank page affords much needed space for an ambling rather than prying curiosity about the past. Fragment 12, thought, barefoot. Fragment 129A. But me, you have forgotten. Carson's art shows us that wreckage requires delicate handling and that poetic practice can often involve the difficult restraint of letting remains be instead of fluffing them up into a completion. Open Knox, that box full of Catullus and of traces of a lost brother, and you will realize that sometimes a text at the end of it all will still be a heap of words, not a halo of meaning that is able to soften the pain of mourning. She has translated for Sappho, Euripides, Aeschylus, Sophocles, Simonides. She has also given to us a Hellenized English, which comes with the delight of having otherwise atomic words come together, bonded anew. Sweet bitter, meat clock, heart dragging, fuck stuck, raw blood butchery. And Carson number six. Do you remember how Virginia Woolf seemed, in every single major work, to be searching for a form different from the last, so that each novel was not really another iterance of the same shape, but became something else, like a wave? Ann Carson does this too, but in her own way. Ann Carson, number seven. I don't know any scholar who is quite so good with short and elegant sentences. Quote, the self forms at the edge of desire, and a science of self arises in the effort to leave that self behind. Carson writes a kind of essay most wouldn't dare to emulate, but I do know more than a few academics in this crowd who have confessed to have dreamt quietly of writing a dissertation or a book as lyrical as, lyrical as Eros the Bittersweet. And Carson number eight. Ann Carson's latest book is called Red Dock, and it is made up of a small drawing of a bat and slender columns of mostly enjammed text, usually no more than six words per line. Red Dock finds a third space between myth and the everyday real, partaking in both, but reducible to neither. 
Jaron is a red winged monster who tends to a flock of oxen who graze by the freeway. The story also features a weak prophet who seems to be able to discern the future, but only five seconds ahead of the present instant, which is hardly enough time for dramatic intervention. And there is also a lieutenant named Sad, who never says the word warfare, only war play, and introduces himself by saying, hello, I'm Sad. <laughs> and Carson number nine. The occasion obliges me to tell you about Ann Carson's accomplishments, but to do so is to recite a litany. Griffin, Elliot, Pushcart, Lennon, MacArthur, Guggenheim, pray for us. <laughs> and Carson number 10. The undercurrent of much of her writing seems to be the prodigious question. The following are some questions that have been asked or answered in her work. What is the difference between poetry and prose? You know the old analogies. Prose is a house, poetry a man in flames running quite fast through it. <laughs> what is a town? Towns are the illusion that things hang together somehow. My pair, your winter. What is the army? A fucking fulcrum of fucking fuc functionality. I can't ever say that, <laughs> sorry. What is a scholar? A scholar is someone who takes a position, from which position certain lines become visible. Why are you so in love with things unbearable? Lament is a pattern cut and fitted around my mind. And Carson number 11. In her poetry, there is a lot of heart, but sometimes the heart that is offered is first clenched in a fist and presented at arm's length. That spreading distance between us and the land of the heart felt is sometimes made by imposing a temporal remove, taking a detour through the faraway past or by means of an outright deflection. But this makes sense since sometimes when someone asks you how you feel, the most honest response you can make is to say, go read Wolf. And Carson number 12. Carson's writing takes place on the razor edge where tragedy and comedy meet most sharply. In Red Dock, there was a war and a girl holding a plastic bag and she was exploded until nothing was left but her glasses. But amidst all the weeping, there is that strange chorus whose first lines are, we enter, we tell you, we are the wife of brain. This wife of brain is so funny to me that I like to repeat it in different voices. The wife of brain. <laughs> Carson has that rare specimen of keen and weird humor that gloriously persists even when shit gets really bad. And Carson number 13. On good days, her writing is the kind that sets the mind to gallop, but in bluer moods, nothing about it is easy. There are times when her writing fails to move. Something, sometimes one feels too struck dumb by her thundering, if not volcanic, gentleness, immobilized by moments when, after the book or box closes, beauty deserts us sudden and swift, like a friend gone mute without explanation. One is left bereft, maybe even betrayed, when even the most gorgeous grief cannot be found to yield a lesson. Here the mind halts. And Carson number 14. On account of Ann Carson numbers one through 13, I feel inclined to reverse the typical order of performance followed by gratitude, to say in advance what is best expressed in the words of Gertrude Stein. Thank you, and I thank you, and I thank you. Uh, ladies, gentlemen, monsters, please join me in welcoming Ann Carson. Thank you. That's the most pleasurable introduction I've ever had. <laughs> it's not often you feel you'll have to struggle to top the intro. <laughs> and thank you, Jillian. That was beautiful reading. I'm going to read a little from Red Doc. Eventually, that's the new book, Red Doc, short for Red Document. It's a sort of a novel about a red man with wings who is a herdsman, has a herd of musk oxen, and a friend, as we've already learned, named Sad But Great, who was in the army and is now out of the army, but somewhat the worse for wear. 
However, uh, before that, here's a curious thing that happened. Um, this novel, Red Dock, the protagonist's name is G, the initial G. One thing I discovered in writing the novel is that he was a devotee of Proust, and in fact, when the novel begins, he has just finished reading Proust, à la recherche du temps perdu, and he's in that unmistakable, to those who have read Proust, um, interval of after Proust. It's a sort of desert that opens because there's now nothing to read. Really, you just want to start Proust over again but have not read it yet, and that's impossible, and there's really no other Proust novel, and so you go to the library and get out biographies or resort to the critical literature or even look up other people who write sort of like Proust, but none of it works, and eventually you kind of settle back into withdrawal from Proust, and in due course, life does begin again in a sort of grayer register. <laughs> but in that interval, the desert after Proust, G decided to do some research, and he wrote up his research in 59 numbered paragraphs, uh, which I found in his desk drawer, and I shall read to you. <laughs> It's a sort of an essay, had he finished it, it would have been a sort of an essay on Albertine, who's the girl interest in Proust, as you know. The Albertine Workout. One, Albertine, the name, is not a common name for a girl in France, although Albert is widespread for a boy. Two, Albertine's name occurs 2,363 times in Proust's novel, more than any other character. Three, Albertine herself is present or mentioned on 807 pages of Proust's novel. Four, on a good 19% of these pages, she is asleep. <laughs> Five, Albertine is believed by some critics, including André Gide, to be a disguised version of Proust's chauffeur, Alfred Agostinelli. This is called the transposition theory. Six, Albertine constitutes a romantic, psychosexual, and moral obsession for the narrator of the novel, mainly throughout volume five of Proust's seven volume in the Pleiad edition work. Seven, volume five is called La Prisonnière in French and The Captive in English. It was declared by Roger Shattuck, a world expert on Proust, in his award-winning 1974 study, to be the one volume of the novel that a time-pressed reader may safely and entirely skip. <laughs> Eight, the problems of Albertine are, from the narrator's point of view, A, lying, B, lesbianism, and from Albertine's point of view, a, being imprisoned in the narrator's house. <laughs> Nine, her bad taste in music, although several times remarked on, is not a problem. <laughs> 10, Albertine does not call the narrator by his name anywhere in the novel, nor does anyone else. The narrator hints that his first name might be the same first name as that of the author of the novel, that is, Marcel. Let's go with that. 11. Albertine denies she is a lesbian when Marcel questions her. 12. Her friends are all lesbians. <laughs> 13. Her denials fascinate him. 14. Her friends fascinate him too, especially by their contrast with his friends, who are gay but very closeted. Her friends parade themselves at the beach and kiss in restaurants. 15. Despite intense and assiduous questioning, Marcel cannot discover what exactly it is that women do together. This palpitating specificity of female pleasure, as he calls it. 16. Albertine says she does not know. 17. Once Albertine has been imprisoned by Marcel in his house, his feelings change. 
It was her freedom that first attracted him, the way the wind billowed in her garments. This attraction is now replaced by a feeling of ennui, boredom. She becomes, as he says, a heavy slave. 18. This is predictable given Marcel's theory of desire, which equates possession of another person with erasure of the otherness of her mind, while at the same time positing otherness as what makes another person desirable. 19. And in point of fact, how can he possess her mind if she is a lesbian? 20. His fascination continues. <laughs> 21. Albertine is a girl in a flat sports cap pushing her bicycle across the beach when Marcel first sees her. He keeps going back to this image. 22. Albertine has no family, profession, or prospects. She is soon installed, indeed captive, in Marcel's house. There she has a separate bedroom. He emphasizes that she is nonetheless an obedient person. See above on Albertine as heavy slave. 23. Albertine's face is sweet and beautiful from the front, but from the side has a hook-nosed aspect that fills Marcel with horror. He would take her face in his hands and reposition it. 24. The state of Albertine that most pleases Marcel is Albertine asleep. 25. By falling asleep, she becomes a plant, he says. 26. Plants do not actually sleep, nor do they lie or even bluff. They do, however, expose their genitalia. 27a. Sometimes in her sleep, Albertine throws off her kimono and lies naked. 27b. Sometimes then, Marcel possesses her. 27c. Albertine appears not to wake up. 28. Marcel appears to think he is in control of such moments. 29. Perhaps he is. At this point, parenthetically, if we had time, several observations could be made about the similarity between Albertine and Ophelia, Hamlet's Ophelia. Starting from the sexual life of plants, which Proust and Shakespeare equally enjoy using as a language of female desire. Albertine, like Ophelia, embodies for her lover blooming girlhood, but also castration, casualty, threat, and pure obstacle. Albertine, like Ophelia, is condemned for a voracious sexual appetite whose expression is denied her. Ophelia takes sexual appetite into the river and drowns it amid water plants. Albertine distorts hers into the false consciousness of a sleep plant. In both scenarios, the man appears to be in control of the script, yet he gets himself tangled up in the wiles of the woman. On the other hand, who is bluffing whom is hard to say. 30. Albertine's laugh has the color and smell of a geranium. 31. Albert, 31. Marcel gives Albertine the idea that he intends to marry her, but he does not. She bores him. 32. Albertine's eyes are blue and saucy. Her hair is like crinkly black violets. 33. Albertine's behavior in Marcel's household is that of a domestic animal which enters any door it finds open or comes to lie beside its master on his bed, making a place for itself. Marcel has to train Albertine not to come into his room until he rings for her. 34. Marcel gradually manages to separate Albertine from all her friends, whom he regards as evil influences. 35. Marcel never uses the word lesbian to Albertine. He says, the kind of woman I object to. 36. Albertine denies she knows any such women. Marcel assumes she is lying. 37. At first, Albertine has no individuality. Indeed, Marcel cannot distinguish her from her girlfriends, or remember their names, or decide which to pursue. They form a freeze in his mind. 
pushing their bicycles across the beach with the blue waves breaking behind them. 38. This pictorial multiplicity of Albertine evolves gradually into a plastic and moral multiplicity. Albertine is not a solid object. She is unknowable. When he brings his face close to hers to kiss, she is ten different Albertines in succession. 39. One night Albertine goes dancing with a girlfriend at the casino. 40. When questioned about this, she lies. 41. Albertine is not a natural liar. 42. Albertine lies so much and so badly that Marcel is drawn into the game. He lies too. 43. Marcel's jealousy, impotence, and desire are all exasperated to their highest pitch by the game. 44. Who is bluffing whom is hard to say. See above on Hamlet. 45. Near the end of volume five, Albertine finally runs away, vanishing into the night and leaving the window open. Marcel fusses and fumes and writes her a letter in which he claims he had just decided to buy her a yacht and a Rolls Royce when she disappeared. Now he will have to cancel these orders. <laughs> the yacht had a price tag of 27,000 francs, about $75,000, and was to be engraved at the prow with her favorite stanza of a poem by Mallarmé. 46. Albertine's death in a riding accident on page 642 of volume 5 does not emancipate Marcel from jealousy. It removes only one of the innumerable Albertines he would have to forget. The jealous lover cannot rest until he is able to touch all the points in space and time ever occupied by the beloved. 47. There is no right or wrong in Proust, says Samuel Beckett, and I believe it. The bluffing, however, remains a gray area. 48. Let's return to the transposition theory. 49. On May 30th, 1914, French newspapers reported that Alfred Agostinelli, a student aviator, fell from his machine into the Mediterranean Sea near Antibes and was drowned. Agostinelli, you recall, was the chauffeur whom Proust, in letters to friends, admitted that he not only loved but adored. Proust had bought Alfred the airplane, which cost 27,000 francs, about $75,000, and had had it engraved on the fuselage with a stanza of Mallarmé. Proust also paid for Alfred's flying lessons and registered him at the flying school under the name Marcel Swan. The flying school was in Monaco. In order to spy on Alfred while he was there, Proust sent another favorite manservant, whose name was Albert. 50. Compare and contrast Albertine's sudden fictional death by runaway horse with Alfred Agostinelli's sudden real-life death by runaway plane. Poignantly, both unfortunate beloveds managed to speak to his or her lover from the wild blue yonder. Agostinelli, before setting out for his final flight, had written a long letter, which Proust was heartbroken to receive the day after the plane crash. Transposed to the novel, this exit scene becomes one of the weirdest in fiction. 51. Several weeks after accepting the news that Albertine has been thrown from her horse and killed, Marcel gets a telegram. You think me dead, but I'm alive and long to see you, affectionately, Albertine. <laughs> Marcel agonizes for days about this news and debates with himself whether he could in fact resume relations with Albertine, only to realize that the signature on the telegram has been misread by the telegraph operator. It is not a telegram from Albertine at all, but from another long-lost girlfriend whose name, Gilbert, shares its central letters with Albertine's name. 52. 
One only loves that which one does not entirely possess, says Marcel. 53. There are four ways Albertine is able to avoid becoming entirely possessed. By sleeping, by lying, by being a lesbian, and by being dead. 54. Only the first three of these can she bluff. 55. Proust was still correcting a typescript of La Prisonniere on his deathbed, November 1922. He was fine-tuning the character of Albertine and working into her speech certain phrases from Alfred Agostinelli's final letter. 56. It is always tricky, the question whether to read an author's work in light of his life or not. 57. Granted, the transposition theory is a graceless, intrusive, and saddening hermeneutic mechanism. In the case of Proust, it is also irresistible. Here is one final spark to be struck from rubbing Alfred against Albertine, as it were. Let's consider the stanza of poetry that Proust had inscribed on the fuselage of Alfred's plane, the same verse that Marcel promises to engrave on the prow of Albertine's yacht from her favorite poem. He says it is four verses of Mallarmé about a swan that finds itself frozen into the ice of a lake in winter. Swans are, of course, migratory birds. This one, for some reason, failed to fly off with its fellow swans when the time came. What a weird and lonely shadow to cast on these two love affairs, the fictional and the real. What a desperate analogy to offer of the lover's final wintry paranoia of possession. As Hamlet says to Ophelia, accurately but ruthlessly, you should not have believed me. 58. Here's the stanza of Mallarmé in English. A swan of olden times remembers that it is he, the one magnificent but without hope of setting himself free, for he failed to sing of a region for living when barren winter burned all around him with ennui. 59. Everything, indeed, is at least double. La Prisonniere, page 362. That's the end of that. So much for research. So I'm going to read a few passages from Red, Red Dock. I think I'll begin with the musk oxen. He has a herd of musk oxen. And in this chapter, we also meet Sad But Great, the war veteran. Typical night herding songs gallop their rhythms and tell of love. G doesn't usually sing to the herd at night. He may talk to them, listen, stand in the herd, listen. That community, a low purple listening, but with a height to the sound. Them listening. They direct it up and out. They stand in a circle facing away from the center, and the long guard hairs hang down to brush their ankles like pines, like queens, like queens dressed in pines. Musk oxen are not, in fact, oxen, not castrated bulls, nor do their glands produce musk, much as misnomer in our present way of grasping the world. But pines do always seem queenly as they sway so grand and anciently from the sky to the ground. Motion is part of listening. As the night goes on, let's say he's there for a number of hours, the motion changes. At first, they just shudder a bit like any large entity come to rest. But gradually, imperially, they begin swaying. Then as one rhythm they pass the sway from shape to shape around the circle, 
its amplitude increasing, its warmth rising from knees to hearts to eyes, its pressures rolling across the large loose joints of the shoulders and down the long bones of the hips. Until at some point with a phrasing as simple as a perfect aphorism, one of them spins up off its shanks and performs a 360 degree spin in air and returns to place, slotting itself into the undulation of the others as firmly as temptation into I can resist anything but. He slips from thought to thought. Wild, wild wildness does surely attract him. Although what he knows about wildness is not much, he knows with the oxen that they prefer common gorse to willow shoots and can balance the top heaviness of their bodies by plating their feet as they walk. While with sad he knows don't mention war play. Funny word war play. Never says war or warfare. I've seen a lot of war play he'd say. War play had me pumped those years. Tip of the switch flip switch inside, she hit the ground, 75, saw the white bag, 75 bullets tore her head off, I saw her hand. I wasn't going to tell anyone back home about, oh, it found its way out, it surfaced. I had a tan when I came home, no wounds, no cuts. Everyone kissed me. Sure, I sat by the fire, I talked to the old man, there were the smells, the bone beneath. Sweat broke out on me at breakfast. I didn't expect to come home, that was not in the plan. Some point I guess the brain cells just give out. You read a hundred military manuals, you won't find the word kill. They trick you into killing. You get used to it, it's okay. You have to. Fear not tolerated. Take you out back and shoot you, they say. Her eyeglasses in the grass. Standard questionnaire. Fine, just say fine. Numb yourself, wireframe. Does it feel good at first? Yes. Play, guns, fire, animals. You know the Carthaginians like to use oxen for night fighting. I'm talking about Hannibal. I'm talking about the Battle of Agar Falernus, 217 BC. Like tanks, but more frightening. They tie lit torches to the horns and stampede them toward the enemy. The Romans panicked. Some ran into the herd, some got knocked off the path to the crags below. Others tried to retreat and were lost in the tundra, never seen again. But what I'm asking, what happens when the torches burn down to the horn, to the hair, to the head, to the bone beneath? So much human cruelty is simply incidental, is simply brainless, simply no common sense. You could take the entirety of the common sense of humans and put it in the palm of your hand and still have room for your dick. Now we shall meet Io, the lead musk ox. She's waking up here. It washes her up from the bottom. Slow fluids of dark slide past each other at different speeds. Light she ignores. Waking is gradual lines of dark into sounds. They line up. Before they do is a moment of terror happening every day she every day forgets. Dry little sound is a bird's neck bones sifting into place to sing. Its eyes open and widen. Birds with bigger eyes sing first. Rackety every day to hear this, every day forgets. A passing snake splits by. Reds leap the clouds in a wind, stirring everything tall all the way out over the river and pinwheeling back as the membrane cracks. Open. The heavens are perfect. Perfection sounds round. Good morning, good Io. Bird drops its note into the round and round the note goes circling the wall of the world and stops. After stops is a gap she listens down into for someone who comes tack, tack, tacking along. She hears tack, 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 slow down and I and hesitate and tack, tack. 
attacking past. Someone insists and someone will hesitate at this hour. With the heavens perfect and all gazes wet and the bird drops another note into the round and round. Coolly every day forget, forgetting all but this, not the difference between this and winter, does she long for it, winter. Where waking is, where two cloven halves of her hooves clocked in ice and blood crisping along arteries at minus 23 degrees is a glory to her. Winter exists and winter is never soon enough. She is awake. Now we shall meet the glacier. At a certain point in the story, G and his companion end up inside a glacier. It's kind of an accident. So at this point, he, G, is exploring the glacier. That old cliche of polar adventure, fatigue flooding his body in waves, this wonderful longing to lie down, surely he's been walking for years, surely he should stop and rest a moment against one of those satiny plains of ice that allure on every side. Cucumber, Shackleton, Spam, why is everything draining away? Why this silver ebbing and flowing not quite reaching his brain? He is so tired. Pour the honey into the jar. He dozes off. A sudden violent sneeze shatters him in all directions. Oh, he says aloud, let's not die in the jar. And with an effort that seems to rip his spine apart, arches his upper back. Stiffened wing muscles pull hard against their roots and move into a lift. Pieces of ice break from the primaries and fall in a shower. Again he strains backward and up against what seem like seams of steel, thinking, maybe I can't do this, but all, all at once the cupboards jolt terribly free and the motion begins. He is rising. Air grabs his knees. Out of black nothing into perfect expectancy. Flying has always given him this sensation of hope, like glimpsing a lake through trees, or that first steep velvet moment the opera curtains part. He is keening down the ice fault, soul fresh, wings wild awake, front body alive in a rush of freezing air. He opens his mouth in a cry as red sadness pours away behind him, and the ancient smell of ice floods every corner of his skull. So other things happen and time passes. Here is a chapter called Time Passes. Stole that from Virginia Woolf, as you all know. <laughs> time passes, time does not pass. Time all but passes, time usually passes. Time passing and gazing, time has no gaze. Time as perseverance, time as hunger. Time in a natural way, time when you were six, the day a mountain. Mountain time, time I don't remember. Time for a dog in an alley caught in the beam of your flashlight. Time not a video. Time as paper folded to look like a mountain. Time smeared under the eyes of the miners as they rattle down into the mine. Time if you are bankrupt. Time if you are Prometheus. Time if you are all the little tubes on the roots of a gorse plant sucking greenish black moistures up into new scribbled continents. Time it takes for the postal clerk to apply your lipstick at the back of the post office before the supervisor returns. Time it takes for a cow to tip over. Time in jail. Time as overcoats in a closet. Time for a herd of turkeys skidding and surprised on ice. All the time that has soaked into the walls here. Time between the little clicks. Time compared to the wild, fantastic silence of the stars. Time for the man at the bus stop standing on one leg to tie his shoe. Time taking night by the hand and trotting off down the road. Time passes, oh boy. Time got the jump on me, yes it did. And then towards the end, he, G, has to come back from his voyaging because his mother is 
in the hospital and this is their last um, time together in her hospital room. Not a casual solitude, he and she. Oxygen machine is wheeled in and hooked up. Her eyelids flutter but do not open. He sits. The room is hot. There is a smell. Does Proust have a verb for this? This struggle she faces now, her one-time terrible date with night. First date, last date, soulmate. Old song lyrics scamper in him. He moves the chair back to the window. She's counting my soulmate gasps of make my heart beat at a fast rate oxygen. He dozes off. Waking to her avid gaze, wide open. She holds in one hand a makeup mirror and the other a pair of tweezers. Here, she whispers, lift tweezer. Maybe you can do it, taps the end of her chin. He hesitates, shrugs, pulls up his chair, takes the makeup mirror and peers close. A beard of very fine white translucent hairs all over her chin. He moves the oxygen tube aside and gingerly plucks a few, plucks a few more. There are hundreds, thousands. He hates waiting for her to wince. She doesn't wince. It's all right, Ma, you can hardly see them, he says. Her eyes fall. Okay, never mind. Sadly, she takes the tweezers back. I look awful, don't I? No, you look like my ma. Now she winces. In later years, this is the one memory he wishes would go away and not come back. And the reason he cannot bear her dying is not the loss of her, which is the future, but that dying puts the two of them now into this nakedness together that is unforgivable. They do not forgive it. He turns away. This roaring air in his arms, she is released. Oxen stand quiet under trees. Io's eyes are closed. It is a hard blowing red evening. The priest speaks about the woman's good life, her exemplary son, her sole situation in the palaces of God. A short notice choir attempts Ave Maria. The coffin is wheeled out the back door of the church and onto a waiting van. Someone closes the doors of the van. G watches it drive off. And the freedom stuns him. Here it is, the promised clearing, where great stags are running at liberty. Say a man has been carrying a mother on the front of his life all these years. Now she is ripped off. Now his life is light as air. Should he believe it? And finally, wife of brain. Mothers in summer, mothers in winter, mothers in autumn, mothers in spring. Mothers at altitude, mothers in solitude, mothers as platitude, mothers in spring. Mothers banking their shots, mothers grackling their throats, mothers dumped from their boats in spring. Mothers as ice or when they are nice, no one more nice in spring. Mothers ashamed and ablaze and clear at the end as they are, as they almost all are, and then mothers don't come around again in spring. I came too soon. Um, uh, please come and uh, look at uh, Red Doc uh, and other books that uh, Ann Carson has given us. And uh, yes, thank you for coming.